In this episode of the Church Security Roll Call, we're going to be discussing the 2006 Ministry of Jesus Christ Church shooting. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Chris with Sheepdog Church Security, and this is your Church Security Roll Call. Today we're going to be discussing the article, The 2006 Ministry of Jesus Christ Church Shooting. If you'd like to read that article, go to our website, sheepdogchurchsecurity.net, and look under the News tab. So let's begin in the Bible. This verse is Ezekiel 33, verse 5, and it reads like this. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. What I like about this verse is that it really is talking about how we need to heed the warnings, the the threats that are around us, and we can't ignore them. Now, I am very carefully... um, I, I, I want you to be sure that what I'm not saying is this, is that, you know, these people failed to heed the warning and therefore they were a victim. Um, instead, I would say that this is something we need to be alert to. I don't want to blame the victims. This is about learning from, you know, what could have, would have, should have happened and then trying to apply it um, to us in our own churches at this time. So please, in no way think that I'm victim blaming here. I think that we're actually honoring the victims of this crime by examining what happened and maybe what takeaways we can have. And that's what this whole series is about. It's lessons learned from church shootings. In this case, in the Bible verse, I really see that when we hear the trumpet sound, when we hear the warning, we can have kind of three different takeaways from that. The first takeaway is a really just a deliberate act of denial, a deliberate act of choosing not to take action when we know there's a threat out there. And that's probably for me, now this is just me, I'm not, I'm not your pastor, I'm not a biblical thought, a scholar, um, is if you deliberately do something, something about the intent increases in me the level of how bad it is you know so if you intentionally you know you hear of a very real threat against your church and you choose not to do anything or you choose to stay home that day you know that's that's to me that's more heinous than the other denial that occurs and that is simply sometimes things are so ugly to look at and consider that we actually kind of you know, we don't want to look at it. We look away. We we say sure, to ourselves, you know, surely that wouldn't happen to us. It wouldn't happen at our church. Now, that's pretty heinous, too, in the sense that the consequences are the same, right? Either straight up denial and something bad happens, or, or, or the next thing is refusal to accept, if you will. I'm running out of words to use to explain these different ideas, but I hope you understand what I'm saying. The result is still the same. Straight up just turning your back on it versus just denying it because you can't deal with the stress or the reality of the threat. The result is still the same. It could be casualties, you know, people that have been killed, people that have been injured from this kind of thing. Or the more appropriate response is we get a threat and we take action to mitigate that threat. Now, if things still go sideways and they don't go in the way we would hope they would go, I think that, you know, I don't know about you, and maybe I'm saying too much here, but if I've done everything I can within reason to safeguard the congregation and something bad happens, I still, of course, I'm going to feel really bad about what happened. But at the same time, there's this... I've done what I could do. You know what I'm saying? I did what I was supposed to do or I could do based on what I knew at that time and the circumstances of things. And I did what I could do. And so I think there's some, a little, maybe just a little, a little reassurance, if you will, within my heart and my mind that I I did what I could do and things still went bad. And, and sometimes that's life. 
right? So anyway, I probably talked too much about Ezekiel 33, 5. But recently, I was contacted by somebody who said that he felt that our Bible verses that I share in each one of these programs was being misrepresentative. I was taking things out of context. And so I almost feel now like, you know, maybe I need to have a disclaimer. Um, I don't know that I've ever claimed to be your pastor. I've never claimed to be that. I'm not a theologian. I do have a, a bachelor's degree in ministry, but that's really, you know, I mean, file that under formal education that may or may not be um, the best thing in the world. But um, I'm not your pastor. And so when I share these verses with you, what I hope your takeaway is more than anything else is that it's something for you to think about, but really it's also up to you to confirm. You know, in the scriptures, they talk about the Bereans that every time they were preached to, they ran home and tested that message. And I'm really asking you guys to do that. Um, like I said, you know, I'm not your pastor. So please, please test what I say. And um, decide in your own heart, in your own mind, based on the scriptures, if what I'm saying is a good takeaway or a bad takeaway. So anyway, you know, the Bible talks about teachers of the law being held to a higher standard. And I got to tell you that um, I'm scared to death of that. And that is why I'm not Chaplain Maloney. I'm not Pastor Maloney. I'm Mr. Chris Maloney. <laughs> Nothing more than that. So anyway, maybe I'm getting on a little pedestal there and I should get away from that. Um, so what we're going to be talking about is we're going to be talking about this shooting. And as you can already tell from my introduction, is that the ta one of the lessons learned is paying very close attention to um, threats that are being made. But let's get into this situation so you understand what I'm talking about here. Um, so this occurred, let me get the right day, uh, May 21st, 2006. And here's what happened. Usually about 20 members attended the Sunday morning services of the Ministry of Church of Christ in a small rented hall in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. However, on May 21st, 2006, only six to eight closely related adults and less than a dozen children were present. Um, they did not know that this would be their last service. Late in the service, the pastor's son-in-law came in. So for clarity, because there's kind of a pronoun problem here, the pastor um, is a woman, is a female. Um, so the son-in-law of the pastor came in. His wife had left him the day before a violent argument, um, by, um, but not the first argument. They've had a long history of violence. Responding sheriff's deputies advised the wife to file for a restraining order. I want to stop here for a second as this, is a lot of states have now adopted um, what we call here in Minnesota a Danko. It's a domestic, um, the domestic assault non-contact order. And basically, it, it, what it is, it's a restraining order. It becomes a crime for them to contact or even come within the victim of the domestic violence right off the bat. It's immediately applied. And now, a piece of paper doesn't save people's lives. However, um, the, the best case scenario is if, if the victim, if the family, or whatever see that this person is trying to contact them either in person, by phone, even here in Minnesota, even through a third party. Like they can't call their friend and say, hey, can you contact my spouse and say this to them or tell them that. All of that is considered illegal. And so a lot of states are adopting that. But anyway, in this case, she was advised to get a restraining order. Uh, she said that she'd do that when the county offices opened on money uh, on Monday. The previous year, she had secured a restraining order, but withdrew it. This is another time I want to stop here and say this. The emotional entanglement between the victim and the offender is often very complex. And 
they are still tied together a lot. So oftentimes from, now this is anecdotal evidence just from my own experience, I've seen a lot of victims that go to court and try to remove that restraining order, that Danko law against them. Um, and I don't want to second guess their personal decision. However, I've seen it a lot and oftentimes it results in, an, in them opening themselves up to further violence. And so a domestic violence professional, psychologist, whatever social worker could really get a lot deeper into that whole entanglement and why victims do what they do. I mean, there's part of me that kind of understands it. Like sometimes there's a financial reliability or, you know, there's a reliance of finances. And so they, they want to keep that relationship going because otherwise they might be homeless. But I'm sure there's a lot more to that. You know, it's very complex. But anyway, relatives describe the relationship as on and off. That's typical of domestic violence. Um, he had an unstable work history, was a gambler, and reportedly unfaithful. So he's actually sounding, once again, I'm breaking away from here, is he's actually sounding like your typical abuser. Now, I don't know him, but these are kind of these normal things where if, if they have a poor work history, they have an addiction to gambling, it sounds like here, um, unfaithful, you can see that the, the way he thinks of his spouse and the way he treats her is less than stellar. Um, it's very corrupt. There's lots of problems going on there. And at the same time you have in domestic violence is the offender wants to dominate and control the victim. They want to have complete control over them. A lot of times they'll create situations of isolation where they want to move them to another town. They want to move them away from their support structure in order for them to control them. Now, in this case, it doesn't sound like that because she was still going to a church that was her family, essentially. But still, you have that you know, you have that conflict. He's trying to control her. She's still maintaining some of her family um, support. And, and because of that family support, she's pulling away from him because she's not reliant 100% on him. She also has family to rely on. But then with that separation, with her pulling away from him, the violence increases. And that's what this is all about. Um, all right, so where were we? Uh, the man asked to speak and the pastor consented. He said he was sorry and begged his wife um, to come back. She, her answer was no. Smart girl. Even if, um, even if she forgave him, she wouldn't come back. He left the room and paced outside. Someone uh, went to check on him, um, then re-entered. Here's kind of another takeaway here is this, is we've, re we've covered enough of these active shooter situations where what we see is the killer comes into the church and they do their thing, whatever. They create a scene, they try to, you know, win back their spouse. Um, you know, there's some sort of behavior inside the church. Then they go out and then come back in. All of us in church security, church safety ministries, that needs to be a, that is a huge red flag to me. They go out, in some of these cases, to go get their weapon, and then they come back to do the killing. So it's almost like because of their emotional condition, they come in to give them a try. I mean, I, I don't want to state that way because I know how horrible that is. I'm just in the mind of the killer here. They go in, they make that contact. They're already planning on a certain, on violence, or potentially on violence. They come in almost to give everyone a chance to 
see things their way, way or meet their requirements and unfair requirements or expectations, whatever it is. And then once that's not met, now it's time for violence. And that's exactly what's happening here. That's what's happening in several of the other church shootings we've talked about. We, as safety team, need to watch this. It's not, our goal is not to meet their expectations. That's none of our business. That has nothing to do with us. You know, we can't force a spouse to forgive another spouse for cheating and gambling and violence. No, never in a hundred hundred years would we want that. But we're paying attention as the safety ministry. He comes in, he makes a speech on the stage. He addresses his, uh, you know, his spouse about their domestic violence problems. He then leaves and goes out to his car wherever he went. And now he's coming back. The alarms in our heads need to be at full alert at this, point, at this time. So let me continue. Uh, the man left but returned when the service was ending. So there's some time lag here. The pastor heard her mother, the pastor heard her mother say, please don't shoot, um, followed by the sound of gunfire. Five wounded persons lay on the floor, including the pastor. All of them were the man's in-laws. Um, she would be the only one to survive. So this is, I guess, the pastor. Like I said, we have a little pronoun problem here in the, in the article. Um, the man grabbed his wife. He was heard, heard saying, I told you I was going to do this. After letting her um, say goodbye to her mother, he took her and their three children to a car and left. Hours later, police found him sitting on a curb, holding his baby and crying. His wife was in the car, dead, a bullet hole in her, the back of her head. Um, he had placed the gun in her hand to make it appear as it was a suicide. The pastor was shot in the back of the head but recovered. Killed in the church were the, the victim's parents, her aunt, and her cousin. Killed elsewhere was her daughter, the shooter's wife, and none of the children were physically injured, thank God. Um, so the aftermath here is this. Psychological effects. Um, as is to be expected, survivors of the responders of the mass killings suffered long-term emotional and mental trauma. The pastor and her husband um, in their, um, took in the grandchildren, the sons of the killer and his wife. So they took on those kids, the three kids. Um, these young ones had witnessed the murder of her mother and other relatives. In an interview with a local station almost 10 years later, the pastor said that the children cry at night. The middle one is afraid to go to the bathroom and the youngest called her mommy. So we're talking serious long-term effects here. Apparently the congregation um, had never met again and uh, was, um, even though it was still recognized a religious organization, um, unless they were meeting in homes, there was no meeting. So basically, this was the end of the church. A year after the killings, a local television station stated that the ministry of Jesus Christ has yet to resume services elsewhere. Eleven years later, after the Sutherland Springs shooting, the, uh, a Baton Rouge television news article reported on an interview with the husband of the ministry of Jesus Christ pastor. Um, the author and newscaster stated, the church on Dallas Drive in Baton Rouge has been closed since. However, asked when how his wife um, was, her husband said she's doing fine, she's serving the Lord and being positive about things. Officially, the corporation um, was still on the books in February 2016, almost 10 years later. The Louisiana... Louisiana um, Secretary of State business registration um, was still listing the ministry of Jesus Christ at the same address as the agent, which is the pastor, even though they long ago vacated the location. 
Um, uh, evidently, after recovering from the wound, the pastor did not change the address of the listing. As of tax year 2012, the ministry of Jesus Christ um, was listed as a nonprofit facts.com website with the address of the pastor. Um, however, they had no assets and um, no income reported. So basically, this act of violence, even though this is extremely small church, ended the ministry. It ended it right then and there. And, um, and to some extent, I understand that, right? I mean, come on. It's a small church destroyed, if you will, by murder, violent attack. And, um, you know, how do you recover from that? You know, I, a lot of times it's like, you know, you hear about these church shootings and some of these churches, many of them somehow struggle and only by the grace of God, as far as I can consider, is they, they somehow recover and they, and they get back to a place of continuing in the ministry. But you know, that's not a guarantee and that's not easy. It's something that's extremely hard to do. You know, who knows about this church? Maybe they'll recover. Maybe sometime in the future, they will start meeting again and they will start to grow and start to affect their communities and, and affect the people that go to that church. But this is possibly, the. I mean, what could be worse? I mean, I, I, I don't know. You know, an active shooter, a killer, in a congregation is a nuclear bomb. It, its effects are very, uh, I, you know, I don't want to, on the one hand, I don't want to give it too much credit because the truth of the matter is this, is you can come out of it. Plenty of churches have done it. They've come out of it. They faced this attack. They've dealt with the fallout of that attack. They've dealt with the hearts and the minds of their congregations. There's been healing. There's been grace. There's been mercy. And there's been, in some cases, like the Sutherland Springs, it's almost an expansion. It's almost like it created a greater growth. Not that that was a good thing, but God can take things that are as ugly as you and I could ever imagine and make something beautiful about it. I mean, that's why he's God, right? And so, but at the same time, this is still a nuclear bomb and it has to be dealt with. And in some cases, churches end because of this. Um, going on, the, the shooter was convicted of murder and sentenced to death um, almost two years later in East Baton Rouge Parish. Um, as the only survivor of those wounded, the pastor was a key witness. Um, the sheriff provided protection even though there was no known gang involvement in the shooting. In that area, witnesses were often at risk. This case was used by pr prosecutors for pushing a state um, for the state to provide money for witness protection. So there's some good out of that, right? Is that our witnesses do need to be protected from violence. Um, to date, the killer is still on death row in Louisiana. During the trial, he dismissed his public defenders, represented himself. Um, he made lewd accusations um, while cross-examining the mother-in-law. Um, I, I feel like I should make a comment on that, but I don't know that I need to do that. Um, obviously, something's seriously wrong with this guy. And so he gets the mother-in-law on the stand and he just verbally attacks her with lewd comments. Very sad situation. He also claimed that his wife did all of the shootings and took her own life. So here you have now a guy who's just trying to save his own life and will do anything and everything to try to preserve it. Um, after the trial, um, he appealed the death penalty, penalty on various grounds, including mental retardation mental and mental illness. Um, this went to the, the Supreme Court of Louisiana in 2010. They found the grounds and evidence for his appeals to be insufficient and upheld the conviction and the sentence. 
As of 2018, he's still unsuccessfully trying to uh, appeal his sentence. Once again, this is just somebody who's trying to do, will do anything to preserve himself. And, and my guess is, is that's exactly what the relationship was all about. It was about him. It was about what he could get, what he wanted, and he would um, do anything for that. And when his spouse was no longer complying with meeting whatever whim and desire that he had, he became a murderer. Um, all right, so lessons learned. You know, take warning seriously. This is one of the challenges we have in the church. And the reason it's a challenge is this. So imagine the scenario. You have a victim of domestic violence. And they, one, they could be struggling in silence. That's a thing. Um, and there's not much we can do about that other than creating environments where people feel free to share their struggles. Sometimes this is small groups. Um, sometimes it's friendship and reaching out to people that we see that are struggling. And maybe we can learn those things from them. And when we do, or they report it, then what we fail to have is a reporting system. So let's say you're leading a Bible study and you find out that somebody is a victim of, of domestic violence or some other sort of violence or suffering from mental illness. Maybe they're the ones that could potentially become the threat. What do we do with that information? For a lot of us, you know, you know, we pray about it. Maybe we talk to our spouse. Maybe we refer to a close friend, a trusted confidant, a mentor where we share this kind of information. But a lot of times that information stops at that point. So the church needs to have a system in place. And the system has to be so open or available that when you hear that information, you know that you can, without a doubt, go to the pastor or somebody else in authority and say, hey, I have a very real concern about this person that's way above my pay grade. You know, what can we do? How can we help them? You know, what are, what are the proper actions? And then we have to have a system to help that person. You know, be it domestic violence, be it alcoholism or mental illness. We need to have a plan to provide very real help to them. And then passing that information off to our safety team. Now, you've heard me talk about this before. I get pastor, patient confidentiality, pastor, parishioner confidentiality. I get that. And it's an extremely important thing. Pastors need to be safe places where people can go and tell them about all the things that are going on, the good, bad, and the ugly. It's got to be an open field there. But at minimum, the pastor should at least turn to the safety team and say, hey, we have an increased risk. I can't tell you who the potential victim is. I can't tell you who the offender is. All I can tell you is that um, we need to be at a heightened level of security. If that's all you can tell the safety team, that's better than nothing. We can work with that, right? I mean, we can work with that. Our, our alert level is going to go up. We're going to be in the sanctuary. We're going to be watching the parking lot. We're going to be paying attention to the exterior, the interior. We're going to be patrolling like crazy. I mean, we're going to be alert to that, to a threat. And so we can work with that. Now, the best case scenario, better than that, if possible, is you active, ask the, vic, the intended victim is like, are you willing to allow me to share this information with our safety team? If that person gives permission, well, now it's open. And they can even control, like, what can I tell them? Okay, what I can tell you is my husband's name is John Smith. And this is what he looks like. And this is the kind of car he typically drives, right? Just because you get a car description doesn't mean you can't borrow one or rent one. 
And um, this is the threat that he's made against my life or my children's life. Then we can actually look out for John Smith and a red pickup truck, you know, that's, you know, six feet tall, 200 pounds and likes to wear denim. You know, we, we have that and we can act on that. And if they have Facebook or any of this stuff, we can also Google them, right? You might find a picture of them that you can share with the team or, you know, Maybe because you know they're driving a you know 2013 you know Ford pickup truck, you can Google what that looks like, and you can even share the the vehicle, this you know, picture of that vehicle to everybody, saying this isn't the vehicle, but this is what the vehicle looks like, and you get that information out there. So anyway, I've I've gone a long time. Um, the takeaway is this: heed the warnings. Listen very carefully. Be very sensitive to what could be going on. Now, if it turns out to be nothing, awesome, right? You heard about something going on. You took some steps to mitigate it. Turns out to be nothing. Good. No problem. You've done your job and the congregation is safe. But if things go the other way, you're more prepared. You didn't ignore it. You didn't deny that it could occur. And you took a very real action to try to mitigate that or as much as you could take because sometimes there's limitations and what you're going to be allowed to do. But do what you can. Always do what you can to safeguard the congregation. Always pay attention to what's going on. Finding out who's at risk, who may not be at risk. What are the current risks against the church? and then making plans for that. So before I let you go, I want to let you know we are right now having a sale on the complete training program. I've talked to you the last couple of weeks about this. Um, it basically allows you to train your team. It also allows you to train other staff and volunteers and different topics that they might need to know because of their job. And um, it's at a really good deal right now. I really encourage you to take care, you know, take advantage of it. I am going to be starting to facilitate these courses online in a Zoom meeting. And so really all you have to do is sign up for it and then share this link with the people of your church. And I'll take care of the training. You're done. There's nothing more for you to do. And so this is, I'm trying to give you an easy button, if you will, that you can just smash and uh, get people trained. So. If you like this video, I am going to encourage you to like, comment, share, all that kind of stuff. A lot of you have been doing that. Awesome. I'm seeing the number of subscribers go up. I'm watching um, how much more people are watching these videos. And really for me, and I, I hope for you too, it's really just about getting information out there so people can start taking action and making their congregation safe. You know, um, I think when you talk about the church, you know, capital C, the large church, just not our single body. Um, when you talk about that, you know, there's there's a bit of cooperation that needs to take place. You know, sharing it with the church down the street, sharing it with the church in another state, getting that information out there to try to help them. And, and, and I think we serve capital C, the church and Christ by getting that information out the best you can. So please like, share, comment. Other than that, thank you so much for watching this program or listening to this program. And hey, let's be careful out there. This program is made for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal advice.